Hello, and welcome back to ED 541 Behavioral Assessment. Uh, we're going to talk today about functional behavior analysis, uh, or it, better known as analog analysis. Uh, we've completed our discussions of both indirect and direct uh, behavioral assessment uh, protocols and procedures, and we're now going to move into more of an experimental analysis of behavior uh, and uh, go through these uh, over the next several weeks. Uh, analog functional analysis was uh, first published in 1982. I had the unique privilege of participating uh, with Dr. Brian Awada, who was the lead researcher, Keith Slifer, uh, Ken Bauman, and Gina Richmond, uh, while we were all employed at the John F. Kennedy Institute, which is now better known as the Kennedy Krieger Institute, uh, which is part of the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Uh, we had um, a both in and outpatient units um, at the Kennedy Institute that were um, devoted exclusively to uh, applied behavior analysis and behavioral psychology. And while we were there, we uh, conducted a, a number of research projects, uh, this being probably the most popular of the ones we did uh, during our tenure. Uh, the, pub the paper was originally published in the analysis and Analysis and Intervention in Developmental Disabilities in 1982. Uh, it was later reprinted in Murphy and Wilson's book on self-injurious behavior in 1985, and then in a special issue of the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis in, 1980, in 1994. Um, it is referred to as an experimental analysis. So the question is, why do we call it analog? What, is, what does the word analog mean? And basically, it means that the variables controlling the aberrant or challenging behavior are experimentally analyzed by performing one or more well-controlled experiments in situ. And in situ means under conditions that are analogous to a person's natural environment. So basically, what we did was we looked at um, a number of individuals. We were at that point running the National Center for the Study of Self-Injurious Behavior. Uh, and we were looking at people who engaged in these behaviors and trying to understand, based on the research of Carr and others, um, why they were engaging in these and how we could uh, determine on a case-by-case -case basis which individual was, was engaging in the behavior as an escape function or for social attention or for other re or self-injurious behavior uh, that was m maintained by uh, sensory stimulation. And we wanted to be able to figure out how we could bring somebody into our environment uh, and figure out uh, in a data-based way, not just an assessment as, as came later by the motivational assessment scale and all of those different instruments that we've already studied, but how we could take that person and look at them and determine in an empirical data-based way which of those functions is actually controlling your individual behavior. And what we decided was, rather than trying to do that in the natural environment uh, and watch the person in their classroom or in some other uh, natural environment, such as their home uh, or their group home or um, in, in school or in a day program, we thought it would be best uh, to try to um, replicate those conditions that we found to be the ones that maintain the challenging behavior and then make sure that those and only those uh, antecedents and consequences were involved were available to the individual and provide those in a highly controlled situation so that I would take you and I would move you from one environment to the next to the next and in each one of those there would be a different set of antecedents and consequences that were operating at the time while you were in that environment. So I'd put you in one environment uh, where um, there is attention available, contingent upon your, your uh, challenging behavior. I put you in another environment where there's no attention um, available but there are uh, demands uh, and, and if you um, are functioning in an escape uh, mode. Uh, you could use your challenging behavior to get me to stop putting those demands on you. And then the other one was to put you in a, in a condition where you were alone and there was nothing else to do and to see if it was based on a sensory stimulation sort of a model. We're going to talk about this in much more detail. Uh, but a cardinal rule in any 
experimental analysis is to hold constant or eliminate as many extraneous variables as possible. So again, we put you in a very controlled environment and we determine what antecedents and what consequences are available in each of those different conditions and we measure your behavior against those different variables. Um, functional analysis uh, we refer to as, a, as systematic manipulation and what we want to do is systematically manipulate potential controlling variables in analog or natural conditions and observe the effects on the student's behavior. Now for what we did in 1980 and 1981 uh, before this study was published was we only looked at analog conditions, that is conditions that were analogous to the person's natural environment. Later on in the next several weeks we're going to talk about utilizing these same approaches uh, in the person's natural environment. Uh, what's the rationale? When information is obtained from direct observation is inconsistent or, or inconclusive, so when, when you do the, the direct assessment or you do an indirect assessment and you're not getting clean results, uh, when you have an emergency situation and you need to be able to immediately develop a functional, uh, functionally appropriate intervention, or one that's not specified here is that when the individual's behavior is of such a level of intensity, severity, or risk uh, that you really can't trust the results of an indirect or direct assessment and you need to move on to one that's going to give you um, uh, pure um, results that you can depend on. Uh, this is designed specifically to test hypotheses regarding variables that are strongly related to the occurrence of the challenging behavior. Now, let me just tell you that um, when we did this, uh, there were no indirect assessments available, there were no direct assessments available, and we hadn't even thought about those kinds of things at this point. But one of the things we did as we, as we began to utilize this evaluation on a number of individuals is I would, I would do the intake on these, these folks and I would meet with the families, I'd meet with the, with the staff that worked with the individuals, I'd watch them. They would come in and they would live on our inpatient unit for, for several weeks while we conducted the functional analysis. And I would determine my own hypothesis just based on um, anecdotal information that I was able to gather. Uh, and I would often write down on a piece of paper what I believe the results of the functional analysis, the analog evaluation, was going to be. And I hate to tell you, but I was wrong more than half the time when I did that. Um, I was not a good guesser as far as developing hypotheses just based on um, interviewing people and watching them in their natural environment. Uh, maybe I could be better at that today after doing so many of them, but back then when we were doing this, I was not very good at determining those. Um, the methods for conducting manipulations, the manipulations uh, of structural or antecedent events, we would manipulate things such as task difficulty, task length, level of attention, the presence or absence of choice in activities, uh, the manipulation of consequences for the challenging behavior such as attention or being able to escape from a demand. Uh, the approaches can be used um, now can be used uh, in a single uh, way or in combination so you can put some of these together if you want to. You can also set up conditions in when you, which you expect to increase behavior and then observe to determine whether the expected effect actually happens. Uh, functional analysis provides what is generally considered uh, the best uh, documentation of a true functional relationship and thus provides the greatest precision and confidence in understanding the behavior. It is not an absolute diagnostic tool, but it certainly gives you much better results and results that you can trust uh, much more than uh, based on an indirect or direct assessment. Uh, and that by establishing this control, it enables you to identify and select the most effective treatment strategy. And of course, that's what this is all about. It's just like a medical model. You do a diagnosis. I mean, you do a you do you run tests. Um, you come up with a hypothesis about why the person is complaining or uh, has these uh, symptoms. In these in this case, it's self injurious behavior. Uh, and then you base your treatment on that. And unlike what we read about in Mickelson and some of the studies with Charlotte and and others 
uh, where they base their treatment on the diagnosis. We base it on a functional relationship between the person's environment and their behavior uh, in what we think is maintaining that challenging behavior. Um, in the analog functional analysis, consequences are maintained during one or more test conditions. Uh, and what you'll see in the 1982 study is we repeated these test conditions a number of times. Each condition is designed to determine if the behavior is controlled by specific environmental sources of reinforcement. Again, in the beginning, attention, escape from demands, sensory stimulation were the three major ones. And if you remember that two by two matrix, that's basically what three of those four um, uh, cells in that two by two matrix um, speak to. So we're going to review a little bit here some of the results of the initial uh, 1982 study. Uh, what we when we ran that study, as you read in your in your um, readings for this week and in in the previous in the history week when you read the same study. Uh, there were nine subjects. We've reviewed this uh, in a previous lecture. Uh, this this um, slide shows uh, some demographic characteristics of them. It gives their age and years, their developmental level, motor involvement, a diagnosis uh, that came with the individual, and what kinds of uh, forms of self-injurious behavior uh, they engaged in. Um, some of the definitions of the behaviors um, that we that we used and over to the right you'll see that it lists the subjects that engaged in each of those different behaviors you'll see that head hitting had four individuals that engaged in that self biting had three uh, head banging had two uh, so this was a pretty seriously challenged group of individuals that we were dealing with uh, as I've told you before uh, the four analog environments are social attention demand and play uh, the last one uh, we referred to, uh, I mean, alone. Uh, the play condition, which we'll talk about in a second, really doesn't match up with one of those cells uh, in that two by two matrix, but we'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, the attention condition, which is often uh, labeled as social disapproval, uh, was designed to indicate whether the behavior is controlled by contingent positive reinforcement. Um, it coming in the form of either negative attention or reprimand, uh, which is delivered by the therapist. And this, this uh, comment was uh, taken from an article published by Brian Awada in, in 2000. Uh, <coughs> the, during the, uh, the attention condition, the individual uh, is basically escorted uh, into the designated room by a staff person. The individual is given a verbal directive from the staff to sit at a table uh, and examine objects that are on the table. Uh, the objects are selected using a preference assessment uh, as things that the individual may like uh, to engage in. Uh, and then the staff member sits down in a chair opposite the individual and instructs the individual that uh, basically I need to do some work. Uh, why don't you play with these toys or these objects? Uh, but I've got some work to do here. And uh, during uh, the 1982 study, of course, being good um, students of behavior analysis, we always walked in with uh, the latest edition of the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis uh, and would sit there and read journal articles while the individual sat at the table. Uh, once they began to uh, engage in some form of self-injurious behavior, uh, we would close the book, we would look at the individual, and we would deliver uh, some form of social disapproval and verbal prompts not to engage in, in the target behavior. Basically what we do is we close our book and we look at the individual and we'd say don't hit yourself, you're going to hurt yourself, uh, you need to stop doing that. Basically trying to replicate the things that we think um, someone in a natural environment who just didn't know better might do um, in a classroom or in a group home or some other environment uh, when someone began to engage in those behaviors. So the only way the person was able to gain our attention and get us to put the book down and pay attention to them was to engage in that challenging behavior. Uh, once we began to do that though, uh, we would pat them on the back, we would touch them, we would say don't do that, don't hurt yourself, you're really going to hurt yourself, you need to stop that, and we would try to get them um, with verbal prompts to stop. Uh, as soon as they stopped engaging in the behavior, we would pick our book up and start reading our book again uh, and ignore them. 
Uh, we would go back, provide the attention if they engaged in the behavior again. Sometimes it was a back and forth and back and forth. Um, and sometimes they would keep our attention by continuing to engage in the challenging behavior. Uh, here's a video clip uh, done by the uh, people at Southern Illinois University, uh, which uh, shows how the attention condition uh, operates. Condition. The purpose of the attention condition is to test whether a child engages in challenging behavior to get attention from others. This condition involves the therapist remaining in a room with a child and not responding to any behavior except the target behavior. Okay, you play here. I have some work to do. Prior to the beginning of an attention session, place one or more moderately preferred toys in the session room. Upon entering the room, direct the child toward the toys and tell him or her to play with the toys while you do some work. After the instruction is given, move away from the child and engage in an activity that will distract attention away from the child. Examples of busy work include reading a book or magazine or picking up a telephone and pretending to be involved in a conversation. During an attention session, attention should only be delivered when the targeted challenging behavior occurs. Each instance of the target behavior should result in brief attention in the form of comforting statements or mild reprimands. Comments should not take the form of threats or bribes. All other behaviors should be ignored. This includes appropriate behaviors such as playing with toys or requesting attention, or any challenging behaviors other than the one being targeted. If challenging behavior occurs most frequently in the attention condition, then there is evidence of an attention function So before we go to the demand condition, one of my favorite comments that the person narrating that video makes uh, is that the, the therapist would go and uh, read a book or do some other task or pretend to talk on the phone. Now, I don't know how many of you have raised children or been involved uh, with uh, observing people raising children in the home, but um, what I've observed over um, my many years uh, being around kids, uh, both my own and others uh, raising children, uh, is that uh, the time that a child, uh, any child, is most likely to engage in a challenging behavior is as soon as mom or dad gets on the telephone. Um, you're sitting there uh, in the den and uh, you're both uh, happy with what you're doing and the kid's not trying to get your attention. Uh, there's nothing bad going on. Everything is fine. Uh, the phone rings. You pick up the phone and as soon as you do, the child begins to um, come over and prompt and pull on you and try to get your attention. Um, I think that um, using that in, in one of these conditions uh, would be um, a, a good example of sort of a normalized kind of attention-seeking uh, condition. Uh, you should have also noticed that in that uh, example, in that video example, uh, the young lady who was a therapist uh, playing the role of the therapist 
um, was reading a, a copy of the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis. Uh, the last comment that I want to make is that the little girl that is in this uh, is a typically developing little girl. This is not a real uh, um, functional analysis of someone who engages in severe challenging behavior, uh, but it's the daughter of uh, someone who works at Southern Illinois uh, and uh, plays the part uh, in this, so it's um, a contrived thing. Uh, the next condition is a demand condition. The demand condition um, often referred to as an escape condition because it's based on an escape function. Uh, the condition is designed to determine if the target behavior is controlled by escape from task demands um, or any kind of demands. It doesn't necessarily have to be a task demand, but some sort of a demand uh, or directive from uh, the adult. Uh, the condition involves presenting uh, tasks requiring instructional demands. Uh, compliances are praised and escape is provided contingent upon the occurrence of the target behavior. So, set the scenario. Um, we basically uh, use normal everyday activities uh, that, can be, that can be used for each individual. Uh, the students should, be requ should require staff assistance to complete the task according to criterion. So this should not be uh, a task that is uh, on the child's sort of list of maintenance skills. It should be so, a, a task that's uh, in acquisition. Uh, it shouldn't be something so difficult that they can't possibly do it. Like we shouldn't be asking this little girl to do some differential equations, but we should be asking her to do something that is just something she is beginning to learn um, that requires some level of focus and attention on her part in some level of difficulty. Uh, you can use vocational tasks, household chores, or IEP objectives, which is uh, normally what we use under these conditions. Uh, staff provide the student with prompts using least uh, to most uh, prompt hierarchy to complete each task according to a set of criterion for completion. Uh, so basically we're using some sort of graduated guidance procedure least to most, meaning verbal, gesture, and physical prompting, uh, and prompts are delivered in um, a descending order utilizing sometimes a five uh, prompt hierarchy uh, or a three prompt, uh, depending on how uh, you do it in your particular situation. Um, again, we have a video uh, made by Southern Illinois uh, that uh, shows a demand condition, um, so let's watch that video. The purpose of the demand condition is to test whether the child engages in challenging behavior to escape instructional situations. This condition involves the therapist issuing a series of task demands to the child using a standard prompting sequence. Demands continue to be presented unless the child exhibits the target behavior at which time the demand trial is terminated. If either academic demands or a tabletop activity is selected, the child should be seated in the work setting with the materials on the table or within close reach. When selecting demands, be sure to include some tasks that the child has not yet mastered. This will ensure that the child is challenged. Before beginning the session, tell the child that it is time to do some work. It's time to do some work. Match green. Nice matching green. Match yellow. That's matching yellow. Good job. <coughs> orange. Wow, you're getting all of them. Match blue. Match blue like this. Match yellow. We match yellow like this. Match yellow. Match blue. Match 
blue like this. Match blue. Okay, you don't have to. We don't have to. During the session, use a standard prompting sequence to present demands. First, tell the child what to do and allow 5 to 10 seconds for initiation of the response. If compliance does not occur, continue the trial by repeating the instruction and modeling the correct response for the child. If compliance still does not occur, repeat the instruction and physically assist the child with completing the demand. If the child is compliant with the demand before physical assistance is used, deliver brief praise. If any other behaviors occur during the demand, ignore them and continue with the prompting sequence. This includes requests for help or breaks, or the occurrence of challenging behaviors other than the target behavior. If the child engages in the target behavior at any time during the prompting sequence, immediately terminate the demand by removing all of the demand materials from in front of the child and turning away from the child for approximately 30 seconds. If challenging behavior occurs most frequently in the demand condition, then there is evidence of an escape function for the child's challenging behavior. So the next condition um, in order is called the play condition. And this condition uh, was something we designed to be sort of a control condition uh, that you could measure uh, the results in the other conditions against. So this is not designed uh, to give the child attention contingent on behavior, to allow them uh, to escape a demand contingent upon their challenging behavior. It's not something that's designed specifically to evaluate uh, self-stimulatory behavior. Uh, the child is basically brought into a room. Uh, no demands are placed on the student. They're provided with access to leisure materials. Uh, and the therapist provides high rates of attention independent of the student's behavior. It is simply what it says, a play condition. And it's something that we would use again as the control so that we would hopefully have the lowest rates of challenging behavior in this condition unless uh, it's a self-stimulatory behavior which we'll talk about in a second. Um, the condition is designed to minimize the likelihood of occasioning or reinforcing any of the target behaviors no matter what the controlling function, uh, and this is due to antecedents and consequences examined uh, in other test conditions being removed uh, during the play condition. Uh, again, we have an example of a play condition uh, on, uh, done in a video by the people at Southern Illinois. You are playing Go Fish. This is awesome. Play or control condition. The play condition is designed to serve as a control condition. This condition involves a therapist and child remaining in the room with several highly preferred items available. No demands should be presented to the child and frequent social interaction should occur between the therapist and child. Before the session begins, stock the room with various toys and activities that are preferred by the child. Bring the child into the room and tell the child that it's time to play. Um, we have the game goldfish and I always win. Really? Mm -hmm. I should have known that before I play. Check this out. What does this mean? Uh, I don't know. I got a fish. Cool. We have Hopefully get something cute. 
I got balloons. Heck you. Did I take the balloons? What? Did I take some of them? I don't know. Did you catch you? You're doing a good job. I got them. I catch them. <laughs> it got a, it's on you. I got chocolates. Oh, you got one. Lion. <gasps> I got chocolate. It's <laughs> my lucky day. Let's check it out. Fish. Ooh, I nice. Got it looks like salad. <gasps> I got a lobster. One more. You get it? Oh, nice job. <laughs> During the session, the child should have continuous access to all of the toys and activities in the room. Praise or positive statements should be delivered at least once every 30 seconds or more if the child exhibits appropriate behavior. Engage the child in play activities, but do not force interactive play if the child prefers to play alone. All challenging behaviors, including the target behavior, should be ignored. If the target behavior occurs at the same time that attention or praise is scheduled, wait until the target behavior has stopped for five seconds before delivering attention. All right, so the last condition is the alone condition. Now, uh, this is a condition that's designed to test uh, for behaviors maintained by automatic uh, reinforcement or sensory stimulation. Uh, the condition involves removing the majority of possible stimuli that could serve as a reinforcement uh, from the environment and providing no consequences contingent on the occurrence of the behavior. Uh, the theory behind this condition is that low levels of stimulation may increase the likelihood or establish targeted behaviors that are maintained by automatic reinforcement. So if there's no demands being placed on the individual. There's no chance that the individual can gain someone's attention. Um, then the only other reason that someone would engage in a challenging behavior in the absence of any other type of uh, reinforcement, either positive or negative, would be that it would be something that would be driven uh, by reinforcement delivered from inside their own body uh, or sensory stimulation. Uh, a couple of comments that have been made is that behavior is deemed to be controlled by automatic reinforcement if the highest level of behavior are present in the alone condition uh, and that behavior is also considered controlled by automatic reinforcement if responding is high or undifferentiated across all the conditions. So. Here's a comment by Awada that I think is uh, very important, and we'll get to it in a minute when we look at some of the results of the, of the original study, is that um, if the person engages in challenging behaviors uh, at a very high level across all the conditions, the play condition, the alone, the demand, and the attention condition, then it's most likely that this is a uh, behavior that is uh, controlled by automatic reinforcement. Now, one thing I need to, to caution you here about is uh, in this last video clip by the people at Southern Illinois, uh, they don't run the condition exactly the way that uh, we did in the initial study. Uh, when we ran the condition, we took someone into a, into a small, uh, what was essentially a therapy room that was about 10 feet square, uh, and that we would put them in the room. Uh, they would have no toys, no, nothing to play with, nothing to do. Um, and there would be no one in the room with them. There would be a chair or a mat for them to lay on, uh, but there would be nothing for them to do, no one for them to gain attention from, um, and they would be left in the room completely alone. Uh, at Southern Illinois, they run it in a little bit of a different way um, where they have a therapist actually go into the room with the individual, which in some ways is a much safer way to run it than we did in the 82 study. Um, 
but it does bring up the the idea that at least in the beginning of a session that is run in this way if someone engages in the behavior for attention and you put them in a room with someone who's going to ignore them totally throughout the course of this session uh, that there may be some initial bursting of behavior trying to get that person's attention uh, and that it's really maintained by uh, social attention and not uh, just automatic reinforcement. So um, this is not run exactly the way I would have liked to have shown it to you, but it's the only example we have. No interaction condition. The purpose of the no interaction condition is to test whether the child's challenging behavior persists under conditions of minimal environmental stimulation. This condition involves a therapist remaining in a room with a child and not interacting with the child in any way. Remove all toys and instructional materials from the room prior to the child entering. The idea is for the room to provide as little environmental stimulation as possible. Enter the room with the child and then move away from the child to a corner of the room. During the session, act as if the child is not in the room by ignoring all the child's behavior. This includes the target behavior. If challenging behavior occurs most often in the no interaction condition, then there is evidence of an automatic or sensory function for the child's challenging behavior. So let's go back and talk about that, that video clip. Um, the first thing is, if the challenging behavior that you're looking at is uh, physical aggression from the, from the individual to, the, to a staff or to anyone, um, then the only way to evaluate that challenging behavior, that, that aggressive behavior, is for there to be someone in the room with them that they can aggress against. They, if you put them in a room all by themselves and it's not self-injury but it's aggression, there's, you have to have someone there for them to be the target of the aggression. However, in the way I look at it, I can't think of an automatic or self-stimulatory basis for aggressive behavior. Um, that's something you might want to think about and post on the forum results and, and talk about that how, that, how that could possibly be. Um, 
However, if the target behavior is property destruction, then there doesn't need to be someone in the room with them. Or if it's self-injurious behavior, there certainly does not need to be someone in the room with them. Uh, so again, it's not exactly the, the example I wanted to show, but it, uh, I think it made its point. Uh, as far as the results are concerned from the 1982 study, uh, these are examples of graphs from four uh, sort of pre-selected uh, children that we worked with. What you'll notice is that um, the graphs are drawn uh, in what's called a multi-element design. That's something that you studied in your research methods class uh, where um, different conditions are run sequentially, but the data paths are lines are connected uh, within the same condition. So like in child number one, you'll see that academic demands or escape um, are graphed with little uh, closed triangles. Uh, the alone condition are closed circles. Uh, the social disapproval are, are open squares and play condition are open circles. And this is probably, of all the data, this is probably the clearest uh, because everything is at zero except the academic demand. So if you were to have been the person to have evaluated this person um, and run the functional analysis on this particular child and you got this graph, what you would basically do is go back and say, my hypothesis is that uh, uh, this is a um, escape-motivated behavior uh, and I'm going to run a treatment intervention that focuses on dealing with escape-motivated behavior. Uh, if you drop down to child number four, that's also a pretty clear uh, set of data. Uh, it's the alone condition that's the highest, uh, and the rest of the conditions have a moderate amount of behavior occurring in them. Um, that certainly would be one that we would think, um, oh, this is probably automatically reinforced. It's a self-stimulatory behavior. Uh, the child engages in the behavior much more often when they're alone, uh, but they also engage in the behaviors in all the other conditions uh, so there is, even when they're with someone and they have the chance of getting someone's attention, um, they're also probably engaging in the behavior uh, for self-stimulatory reasons. Uh, child number two in the upper right-hand corner uh, is someone where this is what we like to refer to as undifferentiated, meaning you can't tell one from the other. They overlap. There's no rhyme or reason why they're engaging in one or the other but it's engaging, they're engaging in the behavior uh, somewhere between 40 and almost 100% of the time in each of the different conditions. This is one where I would say, uh, unlike the child number four, this is one where I would say that this undifferentiated pattern of behavior is a fairly clear indication that it's an automatically reinforced behavior uh, or self-stimulatory behavior. And then you drop down to child number five, and now we have an example uh, where the highest rates of behavior occur in a social disapproval condition. Uh, there are some uh, conditions or some sessions, uh, it looks like session 11 uh, and maybe session 15, uh, where there were some rates of behavior uh, in the academic demand, but consistently um, it's highest in the uh, social disapproval. Uh, so this is one where you think the child is engaging in the behavior uh, to gain your attention. Now this is a graph that we put together uh, that sort of does a, a, a very simple statistical analysis and projects uh, that analysis in a bar graph form or a histogram. Uh, again, something you studied in your, your research methods class. And what it does is it takes each of the children and shows you um, which, of the, which of the challenging behaviors occurs um, in, highest in any one or across all the different conditions and it makes it easier uh, for you to uh, come up with a hypothesis on an individual case basis. Uh, but let me tell you, we did this in 1982 and published it in this journal article. I haven't seen anyone use this way of analyzing the data since. So it's uh, basically we look at the graphs um, the way they were in the, in the slide before and make our judgment from that. Uh, so what are some of the issues in utilizing an analog functional analysis? First is the risk to the individual. Uh, by allowing uh, the individual to engage in the targeted challenging behavior, such as self-injury, uh, for extended periods, each of those conditions were run for 15 minutes. Uh, there's a risk of, of inju injury to the individual or to others. 
Uh, if it's somebody that's highly aggressive, there's a chance that, that the therapist could be injured uh, while they're running these 15-minute conditions. Uh, and by conducting repeated exposure to each of the 15-minute conditions, uh, there's a delay in the implementation of any kind of effective treatment. Uh, if we run it the way we did, we would be able to uh, run uh, four 15-minute conditions uh, in the morning, taking a brief break between each one, and then four in the afternoon. And by the time you run this out until you get good solid data that you can depend on, you're looking at um, anywhere from a week or maybe even two weeks uh, before you're uh, completed with a functional analysis. Another thing that's not listed here that I also think is a, is a real risk is that uh, by continuing to expose somebody to this, uh, there's always the possibility that you could be teaching them a new use for their behavior. So say, say somebody comes to you uh, and you haven't completed the functional analysis yet, uh, but the real underlying reason is that they do it uh, for escape. And coming to you, the only time they ever used their challenging behavior uh, to control their environment was to escape from demands. However, by exposing them to the attention-seeking condition, uh, or the attention condition, uh, they could, if exposed to that condition often enough, you could systematically teach them that they could use their challenging behavior not only to escape demands, but if they're being ignored, they can use the challenging behavior to gain someone's attention. So it's very important that you look at uh, the rate of the behavior, not only across sessions and the way we graft it, uh, but you should look at the behavior within sessions. And if you're seeing a learning curve and they're beginning to engage in that behavior uh, more and more often as, as these sessions go on, then you need to terminate the functional analysis because you certainly don't want to teach anybody a, a new use for a, for a dangerous behavior. Uh, another issue uh, has to do with cost. Uh, this is a very staff intensive procedure to use. You need at least one person in the room uh, running the session. You need at least one person uh, across in a one-way mirror uh, taking data. Often you're going to have a second person doing inner observer reliability. And in our case, we had a nurse or a medical professional there uh, to sort of supervise the whole thing and make sure that no one was getting injured seriously um, and they were able to tell us to stop the sessions if uh, things got out of hand. Uh, there are a lot of resources that are required to be able to do this. You need the space to be able to do it. And the other is that you need, <coughs> unlike um, the indirect and direct assessment procedures, which you need to have experienced staff to do those, uh, to do this, given the level of risk that's involved uh, with these procedures, you really need highly experienced staff to do them. Um, I will tell you now that by taking this class and watching these videos and reading these articles, you are not qualified to run an analog functional analysis on your own, and you should not do that. I think it would be a, a, a very serious breach of uh, ethical standards for you to do that. However, if you want to learn to do it and uh, be able to do it on your own, what you need to do is identify someone uh, who is a senior person who is highly experienced uh, and work with that individual uh, over several um, cases uh, where analog functional analyses are being done until you feel comfortable uh, that you can deal with any kind of situation that comes up uh, during uh, the, the conducting of one of these evaluations. So the conclusion is that the Iwata study uh, was the first attempt to provide practitioners with a model for assessing the actual function of a challenging behavior. Up until this time, uh, and you read a lot of those articles in the, in the initial chapter on the history of uh, functional assessment analysis, a lot of people tried to do this, but there was really no standard, no empirical standard uh, that you could use as a diagnostic assessment uh, to be able to say, uh, this is why, to develop a hypothesis and come up and say, this is, wh this is uh, why I think the person's engaging in the behavior, and because of that, this is the treatment intervention I'm going to use. Uh, since the original 1982 publication, there have been thousands of replications and extensions of the original work. You're only going to read a few of those. Don't worry, I'm not going to make you read them all. Uh, but uh, there, there have been literally thousands of studies, and even today, uh, you're seeing studies that come out from time to time uh, that are uh, coming up with new ways of looking at this. 
um, this one study sort of led the way for uh, behavior analysis to grow from behavior modification into the field of applied behavior analysis as, as it exists today. Uh, the whole idea of applied behavior analysis is for a behavior analyst to think in terms of why does someone engage in a behavior before they prescribe a treatment procedure. However, uh, after 1982 and we published this study, uh, there was a lot of work left to be done, thousands of studies to be run by people all over the country and around the world uh, to go beyond what was the original 15-minute session uh, in an analog functional analysis. Uh, so thank you for your time. I hope you've enjoyed this. And uh, the next uh, two units will be on replications and extensions of this model uh, and how it's actually being implemented today.